We are blessed today as our inaugural Village Lutheran Lecture on Christianity and Culture is delivered by Molly Ziegler Hemingway, the one and only. She is senior editor at The Federalist. Check it out at thefederalist.com. Her journalistic portfolio includes The Wall Street Journal, CNN.com, Christianity Today, The Guardian, Atlantic.com, The LA Times, and more. Always thought-provoking, Molly has been known to ruffle a few feathers for those not quite ready for a dose of the truth. She also, uh, in uh, Get Religion, on Patheos, she for years had uh, called people to account who report on religion and do a shoddy job of it. And uh, just a delight to read. Uh, did the Cardinals win last night? She's an avid Cardinals fan, brought her own hat. And uh, while Molly is proud of her Cardinals, I know she is all the more proud to be the wife to Mark and mother of two beautiful daughters. Even more, Molly identifies herself as a Christian, a confessional Lutheran, made holy in baptism, as, and as one who proudly confesses Christ. So... This is a real treat to have you here. Join me in welcome, welcoming Molly Ziegler Hemingway. It occurred to me this morning that I should have told something to the organizers a long time ago, months ago, which is that I don't do mornings. I. <laughs> I mean, I've been downing coffee there in the, in the narthex, uh, just trying to get to the point where I can put sentences together. I apologize. I mean, it's going to be probably four hours before I'm actually able to, uh, to, to be a human. But um, it is wonderful to be here, and I, I am so grateful for this opportunity. I uh, thought that I would just kind of take you through my career and uh, we are going to take a break, and then we can talk a little bit more about specific hot-button issues and whatnot. And, uh, well, we'll see if I need to refer to my notes right now. Um, but I, my story begins really with my parents. My parents are both converts to Lutheranism, and my dad converted uh, as a precocious child, and my mom converted through meeting my father. She's actually from the St. Louis area, and she was raised in the old ENR, as she put it, the Evangelical and Reformed Church, and uh, that became the United Church of Christ. And she didn't really know much about Lutherans, except her family had told her that they were the worst people in the world. <laughs> so uh, when she announced that she was converting, this did not go over well at all. Um, of course, the end of the story is that nobody remained in the United Church of Christ and a couple of her siblings became Lutheran and uh, so she won the day at the end. But, um, so my dad is a pastor in, in Colorado, he's actually retiring this year after 40 years in ministry and uh, they went to a seminary not in this town, um, in, uh, Fort, in, uh, actually it was in Springfield, Illinois at that point and my brother and sister were born there. I was born at, at my father's uh, first call, which was in Kimmerer, Wyoming. And then we moved to California, Terrabella, where we lived for about 10 years. And then we moved to Colorado, which is uh, the congregation that my dad is retiring from now. And I, uh, I'm actually thankful to have been a pastor's kid. I wasn't always thankful to be a pastor's kid. That is a really difficult uh, to, uh, way to grow up in many ways. but. Um, I knew I wanted to, to work in economics. That was something I never doubted. Ever since I learned about economics, I thought, this is what I want to do. I'd like to be an academic. Went to college, never changed my major, got out of college, and soon realized I didn't want to be an economist, which is a really bad time to realize that you've made a mistake. <laughs> um, but I was working in finance and whatnot, and I noticed that all of my friends who were reporters, I noticed two things about them. One, they made no money at all and two, they loved their jobs. I mean, just loved them. They really seemed to enjoy what they did every day, unlike the rest of us who didn't. And so I just kept on kind of paying attention to that. And I was working at a university, and um, 
I found myself out of work. And really, everybody should be fired three or four times in their life. That's a really good thing to go through. Uh, makes you really appreciate what you have and whatnot. But I found myself out of work, and I'd already been thinking, this was actually after September 11th, I'd been thinking a lot about uh, religion, and I had been realizing, it was kind of much to my surprise how interested I was in religion. I'd grown up, you know, in this highly religious family, but that was something my dad did. When I moved out to Washington, D.C., from Colorado, I wasn't even sure if I would, I was kind of thinking, am I still going to go to church every Sunday when my parents aren't right there watching me? And much to my surprise, I did. I mean, I almost felt like it was something outside of me bringing me up every Sunday morning and getting me in the car and uh, you know, driving me down 395 to my congregation. But I, uh, I remained active, and I even began thinking about going into church work. And this was just very interesting. I talked to my dad and my mom about it, and my dad said that he thought, and I was thinking about going to one of the seminaries, I was researching the different programs at St. Louis and Fort Wayne, talking to him, and he just thought this was a great idea. He thought this was fantastic, really encouraging me. And my mom said that she just wanted me to be aware that you don't need to actually officially work for the church to serve God, that you can serve God any number of ways, and it doesn't have to be through church work. So I kind of kept that in mind. Okay, I'm out of work decide I'm going to make a go for it as a reporter. And I probably picked the worst time imaginable to make a go for it. It was right after the terrorist attacks, advertising revenue fell, people were getting laid off left and right. So here I am trying to get a job competing with people who were actual journalists with tons of experience. And I, um, I finally got a job at a Spanish language publication called Radio y Musica. And they believed that I spoke Spanish, which is really funny. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, I, I had grown up in California. I'd picked up a little. And I learned that I can speak a little either if I've had a little bit to drink or if I'm afraid that I'm not going to be able to pay rent. And that is all that I need to, uh, to be able to do it. So, but I was not working as a journalist. I was really answering phones. I was delivering faxes. I see there are some young people here. I don't even know how I could explain faxes to you. They were something we used to use. It came in on a transom, you handed them out, making coffee, this type, and answering the phones in Spanish and English. But I finally got an opportunity to write for the, for the English language sister publication, and I was hooked. I mean, I just enjoyed the process so much of researching a story, putting it together, and then getting to see it on the front page of the publication with my name. I mean, I, I just... I was totally hooked. And also at this time, again, it was shortly after September 11th, and there was something in the news that uh, involved our church body, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod. And it was one of these stories that was just being reported horribly. Nobody knew the underlying issues, and we were getting a lot of bad publicity, and it was very frustrating for me to watch. And I'd been so accustomed as a Lutheran to, you know, we might not get much coverage much favorable coverage, but we didn't get any negative coverage. But here I was experiencing this. And so I decided I would write a piece explaining why we do something, which is we don't, as you know, do interfaith worship. This is something that's not terribly controversial among us, but in America, particularly after September 11th, everybody thought you should just join together with all different religions, do interfaith worship as a sign of patriotism. And I knew that we, I, you know, we reject unionism and syncretism of every kind, and I knew that we had very, um, you know, a long history of doing this and, and very solid reasons, that it had a large part to play in why we actually are in this country, was a desire to, uh, it was a refusal to do joint worship against our conscience. And so I was like, I'm gonna write this up and I'm gonna, I want everybody to read it. So I wrote up an explanation and then I picked out, I, I thought I would just rank all the newspapers by circulation and I would just start at the top. And I was gonna get this in there, which is ludicrous for someone who's only been published in Radio y Musica to think that this is going to work. <laughs> but I, I wrote it up, it turned out really well, and I said, I'm gonna, I'm gonna send that to the Wall Street Journal and just see what happens. And much to my surprise, they said, yeah, sure, this is great, we'll run it on Friday. So I. That was actually a horrible lesson because it made me think that you could get things like that published very easily. And in journalism, you need to be prepared to be told no a thousand times before you get a yes. Um, but 
nevertheless, I was very pleased and I enjoyed the experience a lot. And I um, you know, kept writing at, for this radio publication. And then of course, that publication closed, I got laid off. Uh, I talked to my parents again and I talked to them about moving back home. And my dad said, yeah, definitely, come on home. You're welcome anytime, you're my daughter. And my mom said, absolutely not. <laughs> so, so I didn't get to go home and I had to keep trying to find work. And I found a job at this Gannett publication that covered the federal government. And they wanted a reporter who could cover the waste, fraud, and mismanagement beat. And during the interview, they said, now, could you just kind of give us some ideas of what you might write about? Because we have previously struggled to fill this position or keep it filled because reporters have a hard time coming up with story ideas. And I think I just went on for 15 minutes with just off the top of my head story ideas of all the waste, fraud, and mismanagement that I imagined were in the federal government. And I worked for that publication for many years, and I never, ever didn't have a story that I could pursue about waste, fraud, and mismanagement. But I always thought it was funny that other reporters struggled on that beat, which speaks to some deeper biases they have about, about the government. But at this newspaper, I learned how to write multiple stories a day. I learned how to just get on the phone, call people, and pound out a story. It was great experience, even if it was writing about the bureaucracy, which is not the most exciting thing to write about. And I knew that this, you know, I didn't want to die working at this publication. I had, you know, I had wanted to write about different things, and I got advice. I'd really enjoy writing about religion, but I also enjoy writing about baseball and economics. And I talked with someone who advised me to just pick one area and stick with it. And I noticed that a lot of people write about baseball and a lot of people write about economics and not a lot of people write about religion and editors seemed to enjoy when I wrote about it so I just stuck with that. And uh, during that time, I won a journalism fellowship to do an in-depth study of civil religion in America since I was interested in that topic and how Lutherans are different than, than other church bodies on this topic, which was great. And I also began working at Get Religion, which is a media criticism site where we analyze how well the mainstream media handles religion news. And we cover all sorts of things there. And I, I for instance, you know, just pointing out basic errors that reporters make when um, just covering a church body, doctrinal errors, or even sillier errors than that. Like the New York Times this year said that Easter is when Christians, um, what did they say? Easter is the holiday when Christians celebrate the resurrection of Jesus into heaven. Um, and then like their correction on that, they did admit that they got that wrong, but their correction also had an error. I can't remember exactly how they put it. And they said something like, um, that's a different holiday, as if that, as if that marks <laughs> ascension or something. So, you know, this is, this is the most elite newspaper in the country and they don't know basic facts about Easter. Uh, Richard John Newhouse said that he once met with a reporter and he was talking about some problem in the Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church, and had said something about, well, it's always been thus since the garden. And the reporter said, now, what garden is that? <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and another time, there, like we, we covered this when reporters thought that they had breaking news about how, I think it was Pope Benedict, they learned that this pope would be the Bishop of Rome, as if every other pope hadn't also been the Bishop of Rome. <laughs> and, um, you know, so they're just silly errors like that, but they're also sort of more serious and problematic errors. Uh, they don't get the central tenets of Christianity right. They don't understand the importance of forgiveness. They're very good about, not very good, but they obsess about writing about what Christians say about the law. They don't even know how to write about what Christians say about the gospel. And if you don't put those things together, you present a very distorted image of Christianity. And this is a problem that's very challenging, and I don't really think there are easy answers for reporters, but a lot of what gets into the media, a lot of what gets into the news, it needs to be new. 
or it needs to be contentious. And so a lot of church bodies get left out of good religion coverage because, for instance, they're not political. And a lot of people on, a lot of church bodies on left and right are political and they get tons of media coverage. So then those church bodies that don't think the job of a church is to be obsessed with politics, they end up not getting any coverage. Also, they, and that's true for left and right. And then it's also true that if it's not new, it's not considered news. So any church body that retains traditional teaching, the traditional teaching of the church, retains the liturgy, is going to be less covered than the church body that's uh, chasing the culture about you know, how to worship or uh, you know, what the doctrinal tenets should be. And so that also means you get very unbalanced coverage of religious groups. You're gonna see a lot about the Episcopal Church because they're very political, or you're gonna see a lot about the evangelical right because they're political, or you're gonna see a lot about how they have changed their worship practices to follow the culture. But it just makes the rest of us invisible, even though we represent probably a larger swath than these uh, more outlier groups do. Anyway, so I, um, actually, let me, as I mentioned, I have no idea what I'm saying or what I'm doing until about uh, 1 p.m., but I uh, just want to make sure I'm not leaving out very, you know, really important stuff. Um, okay, I should also mention at this point in time that I did get married and uh, had, <laughs> had my first child, at which point I wanted to leave my full-time newspaper job so that I could be home with my oldest daughter. And continued my freelance career, continued writing for Get Religion every day, uh, where we, where we uh, never lacked for work. And also I picked up other freelance jobs so that I could stay home. I wrote a column for Christianity Today for several years where it was called Throwing Inkwells, the Lutherans might get that reference, and got to talk about sort of the Lutheran approach to, to hot button topics. And, um, one of the more interesting things that happened at Get Religion um, during that time, well, you know, we, we really like to cover, we like to focus on religion news, not social issues there. But it was impossible to avoid talking about social issues because there's so much overlap with religion. And there was a story that I had covered there for years, and it was about, um, it was a very, it's a very, challenging and disturbing story. It was about an abortion doctor in Philadelphia named Kermit Gosnell. And his story came out when a grand jury indicted him. And they had issued a report that described him as running a house of horrors. And he had been in business for decades. He had only been caught with what we'll talk about here in a second. He'd only been caught not because he'd broken any law regarding abortion or because, he had, because people had uh, been in investigating his clinic because of abortion. They caught him because he was, I think, wrongly uh, prescribing drugs and they were investigating that. And when they showed up at his clinic, they found mayhem. They, they found body parts. They found that he had kept trophies of the children that he had delivered before killing. He had, again, done this for, this is decades long practice. He was, his specialty was late term abortions. He would fully deliver the child and, sorry, just feel like, you know, it's very, it's, it's horrific details about what was happening to these children and the horrific way in which he killed them. And of course, what made it very interesting was if he had done it in utero, if he had just not delivered them prior to doing what he did to them, snipping their spinal cords, it, he, it would have been a, it, it might have broken some laws, but it would have not been, we have this arbitrary distinction that once you've made it through the birth canal, then you can't do to babies what you can do before they, um, while they're in utero but he kept trophies, he kept feet. He kept these trophies in the refrigerator with the employee food. Um, there were cats running around. There was cat urine, you know, coating the, the clinic. He also was engaged in practices like giving white women better treatment than black women. Uh, a woman had died under his care through his shoddy work and she was an immigrant. Um, he had a practice where you could sort of pay 
It was a very painful thing to go through, and you could pay for pain meds, and you only got the appropriate pain meds if you paid the highest amount, but if you didn't, then you didn't get appropriate pain medication. I mean, it was just absolutely horrific. And when this report came out, I thought, wow, this is, um, you know, this is going to be the biggest story ever. Here we have a serial murderer who's been operating for decades. It's got everything that the media normally care about, you know, racial injustice, injustice against immigrants, you know, health care regulations, every, you know, just so many things that, that you would expect the media to care about. And they did, in fact, that first day, they, they ran stories about it. And I thought, well, yeah, this is, this is it. This is a big story. And then it basically dropped away. So I've been covering it for years, and I kept thinking, you know, I, I do think people should be giving this more attention. They should be doing exposés. They should be investigating how often stuff like this happens, where in other states this happens. They should be looking into every person who dies from a botched abortion, you know, which does happen. Uh, you know, you, you, get, you get media reports about this every year. And instead, there was just nothing. And I thought, well, maybe they're just waiting for the trial. Maybe that's it. And the trial happened a couple years later. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, I had been patient and waiting for the bombardment of media coverage. There was barely anything at all. Barely anything. Some newspapers didn't cover it at all. The broadcast outlets didn't cover it at all. And I couldn't believe it. I mean, we live in an environment where the least little thing becomes a national news story for, for weeks or months. I mean, we're in a state where you guys remember the name Todd Aiken, and that was something that everybody in the entire country knew about. But here you have an actual serial killer who operated freely for decades related to one of the hottest topics in our country, and you don't get any media coverage? Isn't that weird? So, I don't know what happened, but finally at some point I had just been fed up. And also um, Kirsten Powers, who's a great journalist out in uh, DC, wrote a piece for USA Today about the lack of media coverage. And I said, that's it, I've had enough, I was angry. I took to Twitter, which is not normally something you should do if you're angry or want to do anything <laughs> worthwhile with your life. But I decided to just start asking individual reporters. You know, if I, I was always railing against the media but I thought, what if people had to actually explain why they were part of this media blackout? And so I just started you know, asking them. And I would tally up how many stories they'd written about, say, Todd Aiken, or Sandra Fluck, or the Susan G. Komen Foundation, when the Komen Foundation tried to stop giving money to Planned Parenthood. And then I would compare it to what they'd done with the Gosnell media coverage. So I did this with many reporters, but to give one example, I asked the Washington Post's health policy reporter why she had written 88 stories about Todd Aiken, Sandra Fluke, and the Susan G. Komen Foundation combined, and zero about Kermit Gosnell. And she said, um, in sort of very condescending fashion, she thanked me for my question um, and said that she was a health policy reporter. She didn't cover local crime stories. Right. I am, I sort of immediately, I just, I said, did everybody else see that? Like what she just said? And uh, everybody else did in fact see what she had just said. And they just started showing like all the many examples of the way the media covers local crime stories all the time. I mean, you might remember the, the tragic story about George Zimmerman and Trayvon Martin. That was a local crime story involving two people. Did the media treat that as something that was only going to be covered by the local newspapers? Hardly. I mean, there, there are hundreds, thousands of stories, um, dozens in each newspaper about local crime stories like that, whereas nothing about this. So, uh, anyway, through a combination of efforts, I'd say with Kirsten and myself, we were finally able to force people to finally cover this topic. And they didn't do a good job covering it. They didn't in any way do an appropriate job. But everyone did have to admit that they had that they had not covered the story, they had not covered the story in part because of their biases, and um, you know, I don't know how much it improved the overall coverage at the end of the day, but it was a, uh, you know, it was a very important, you know, we finally got at least some attention for all of these victims of Kermit Gosnell. And that was, yeah, that was an interesting time at Get Religion. Anyway, uh, so I, so I mentioned that I had gotten married, had these kids, and finally my children 
uh, entered school full time, and so I had an opportunity to uh, start a new website, which we started just last September called The Federalist. And we cover uh, political stories, cultural stories, religion. Our whole idea is that we are not hostile to people of faith like many media outlets are. And we get to cover just a wide range of topics that are of interest um, at the intersection of liberty and virtue. And I am senior editor there and I get to write a lot about you know, pretty much anything that's in the news, and then I also get to solicit stories from other people. We target a uh, you know, kind of a younger demographic, and we uh, publish people from all over the country with fresh ideas about how to handle you know, cultural problems or political problems, and uh, we had a sense that this would be an important niche to fill, and we have been extremely pleased with the uh, response. We just have wonderful page views. Uh, we've, I think, exceeded all of our expectations about what we could accomplish, and uh, it's, been, it's been a great opportunity. Um, and so that is, that is basically uh, what, I've, what I've gotten to do in my career. And I do want to mention, since, since it's a Lutheran audience here, a uh, few things that have been particularly helpful for me in my career as a Lutheran. And first and foremost, kind of goes back to that thing that my mother said about how you can serve God. You don't need to actually you can serve God outside of actual church work. And that was something that really helped me understand that I could, um, I could have a fulfilling job and I could help serve God by serving my neighbor. Um, and so, you know, the Lutheran understanding of vocation has been extremely helpful. It's also helpful in terms of understanding what my given job is at a moment. Um, a lot of people who are Christian, I think they go into jobs and they think their job is like to convert everybody. And because of our understanding of vocation, I understand that as a journalist, my job is to just do a good job being a journalist. It's to report a news story. Um, it's just to be somewhere where other people can't be and tell them about what's happening at that event. It's about uh, using my God-given faculties to just provide analysis or um, provide a different perspective or whatnot. And I, it's, not my, it's not incumbent upon me to convert everyone in a story that's just not my job, that's not what I'm supposed to do. I'm just supposed to do a good job reporting the news or if people ask for my opinion, it's my job to give my opinion. And that is a very liberating, uh, it's a liberating way of understanding what I get to do. And also, I'm appreciative. I'm sure my dad, who was my pastor, didn't think I was paying attention during catechism, but <laughs> I did pick up a few things. And I think about how early on I, had been chastised actually by some friends who are pastors. They thought that I, I was quoted in the Washington Post saying something, and they thought that I had not put the best construction on my opponents. And they were right, I had not. And it was a good reminder in our understanding of the Eighth Commandment that we uh, put the best construction on what everyone is doing. We don't question motivations. This has been very helpful in my journalism. It's not my job to try and figure out why someone uh, you know, thinks it's okay to to have abortion on demand or something like that. It's just to report that they do or to report how they cover it or whatnot. And that has been extremely helpful. And I also just like being Lutheran, just having the opportunity to have a different voice in, in public debates. So a lot of our public debates in this country are dominated by the sort of liberal mainline left and the evangelical social conservative right. And Lutherans have a different perspective on a lot of these topics. We have a different understanding of the two kingdoms and confessional Protestants in general, I should say, do. And being able to just talk about the, the different roles for the church and the state and um, you know, what, the, what the job of the church is to forgive sins and the job of the state is in terms of um, you know, holding the sword. And that is, a very helpful framework that when people are introduced to it, they really enjoy hearing about it. It's not something you're going to hear about normally in the media, but it's something I've uh, enjoyed being able to present to other people, and just all sorts of different uh, sort of Lutheran approaches to this, even the, the centrality of forgiveness being something that you don't pick up in a lot of uh, public discussions from, from a lot of different church bodies. So I, um, I'm you know, very thankful to have had these things. I think it's benefited my journalism career quite a bit. Um, but yes, actually, so I was going to, I thought that it might take a little bit longer to tell my scintillating story about my career, um, but 
I, we can either go sort of into some of the religious liberty stuff right now, or if anybody has any questions, you can shout them out and I can, I can answer them. No questions, right? <laughs> no, just kidding. Okay, well, um, we, uh, one of the things that was really interesting about speaking this month is that we scheduled this way back. Actually, I would just like to point out that Susan Hammond shanghaied me on a very bitterly cold day. We were, uh, we were marching you know, to the Supreme Court for the annual March for Life, and uh, she's like, I'd like, to get, I'd like to get you out here. And I sort of jokingly said that I would do it as long as I got to go to a Cardinals game. <laughs> and um, she's, like, she's like, got it, we got it, we got it all taken care of, we're gonna do this. So um, it was really the coldest I've been in a really long time. But um, I'm very thankful that, uh, that we did get to go to that Cardinals game last night, which was a great game. But uh, you know, we, we knew we were gonna talk about religious liberty issues, but we didn't know that it was gonna be so much in the news at the time that I was coming out here. And that decision came down on July 1st. I was recently in Mexico visiting my in-laws and they had arranged for a, a wonderful boat trip for all the family to go out on the Sea of Cortez. We'd have a lovely day. And of course, the day they picked was July 1st. Now, I had been covering Hobby Lobby since before it was Hobby Lobby. I have been covering this topic since nobody was covering the topic. I mean, I've spent years of my life caring about this particular, what became this particular Supreme Court case. I thought, oh, I know, in, you know, finally, every day I waited for the Supreme Court to come out with a decision until the, you know, the last day it could come out was July 1st, and it was the day that we were supposed to take this boat trip. I made the right decision. I went on the boat trip rather than stay home and uh, read all the coverage, but um, it was so weird to be out in the middle of nowhere with no Wi-Fi and not know anything about uh, what had happened in the case. But of course, when I did finally get reconnected via the internet, I couldn't believe the media coverage of what had happened. I was elated, of course, that the court had made the correct decision that religious liberty should be preserved. I was appalled at the media treatment. I don't know how much you all saw of it, but it was just seemed like a complete and utter meltdown on the part of the media. And, you know, on the one hand, it's disappointing and surprising. And on the other, it's kind of how they've behaved throughout the whole story. The story does go back to the um, Patient Protection Affordability Care Act uh, commonly called Obamacare, but the, the mandate that companies have to provide 20 forms of contraception, including those that, that act as abortifacients, that's not actually in the legislation. The legislation gave authority to agencies to issue regulations, and it was in, it was in that authority that this happened. So uh, an agency issued a regulation saying that um, everyone would have to cover these 20 forms of birth control, including those that act as abortifacients. And immediately, you had just widespread outcry from people who figured out that either this was something, a, a particular issue they didn't want to be forced to do against their conscience, or they just kind of figured out that even though they didn't have any particular problem with birth control, a government that could tell you to do this is a government that can tell you to violate your conscience on a separate issue. And so you saw people all across the spectrum joining together to raise the red flag on this topic. You had, you know, everyone from you know, Jews, Methodists. If the Methodists stand up for it, you know you really messed up. But no, I'm just kidding. Totally joking there. But you had, you know, Mennonites, Lutherans, Baptists, everyone just said, you know, this, this does not sound good. And again, regardless of whether they had particular issues with the mandate. And the, there, there have been different variations of this regulation, either depending on the audience, if it's a nonprofit corporation or business or whatnot. But the original religious exemption was so narrow that one nun quipped that Jesus himself wouldn't qualify. And it was true. I mean, they had a rule that you couldn't serve people outside your faith and get the religious exemption, which, you know, we all believe that our works of mercy should serve everybody. And uh, so we wouldn't, you know, qualify for this exemption. It's rewritten in different forms, but it's never been rewritten to the satisfaction of the vast majority of people who have complaints about it. So the, was it 2012, early 2012, something very interesting happened. Um, and it, it's a very rare occurrence that every single Roman Catholic bishop in the country issued a letter to their parishes saying, we've got a huge problem on our hands, huge encroachment on religious liberty. Everybody needs to work really hard to fight this. 
Now, normally when you have something like that happen, I think that has only happened once prior in American history that, that every bishop has sent out a letter raising an alarm, which I think was during World War II. So it's a very rare occurrence. And yet it received almost no media coverage at all. And what was interesting is that at the same time, by the way, can you guys see my wound here? I just feel like I should mention what this is. I was making guacamole the other night, and um, apparently I'm not very good at it because seven stitches right here. Yes, I'm really thankful that I have my finger, but it just seems like it's this bandage that's floating out here. Um, anyway, so do not trust me to make guacamole, and I did not serve that guacamole that <laughs> night. Actually, I we're clear about that. Anyway, so that same month that that happened, another thing happened, which was that the Susan G. Komen Foundation, which is ostensibly about uh, fighting breast cancer, was trying to extricate itself from its relationship with Planned Parenthood, which is the country's largest abortion provider. They kill 300,000 unborn children each year. They get $500 million in taxpayer funding. And um, you know, probably the most controversial organization in the country, but not among the media. And Susan G. Komen was losing donations because pro-lifers just didn't feel comfortable giving money to a group that was giving money to Planned Parenthood. And also, Planned Parenthood had nothing whatsoever to do with the mission of the Susan G. Komen Foundation. Uh, they didn't perform any mammograms, so it was just kind of a waste of money that you're, you're giving to Planned Parenthood. What Planned Parenthood could do is you could go to Planned Parenthood and say, should I get uh, checked out for breast cancer? And Planned Parenthood would say, yeah, go to the doctor and get checked out. I mean, there's no need that, to be giving the amount of money that Komen was giving to Planned Parenthood. So they're trying to extricate themselves, and in response, Planned Parenthood had this amazing, savvy PR campaign ready to go, uh, which they rolled out, and the media just, they didn't just cover it, they covered it at the beginning of every broadcast. They, I think Andrea Mitchell might have wept openly on air. I mean, it was just... <laughs> It was unbelievable, and I'm watching, and they were spreading misinformation, in part because Planned Parenthood had spread some misinformation about uh, what it actually did in terms of health care. Um, and it was just, you know, day after day of unrelenting media coverage. And I just thought it was interesting that those things happened at the same time, that you have this major threat to religious liberty. Hardly anyone noticed that what the Catholics were saying about this. Hardly anyone had noticed that uh, people were raising the red flag on that. You have this other issue, the savvy PR campaign, you know, all around the news, unrelenting. Every little thing that happened, you'd get an update. You know, every time someone said anything about it, CNN sent out breaking news alerts on it. Um, and, of course, they forced the Komen Foundation to back down, so Komen continues to fund Planned Parenthood, which is the country's largest abortion clinic, uh, yeah, abortion provider. And... What was also interesting about it is that the people who were behind the Planned Parenthood campaign were affiliated with this PR firm in DC that is also closely affiliated with the White House. You know, it's not un uncommon that you have PR professionals that are closely affiliated with one White House or another. Um, but this is when you started to really hear about something called the War on Women. I'm sure you have all not heard about the War on Women. <laughs> and so, moving along, we then have, you know, people are continuing to be alarmed by this religious liberty threat. Republicans figure out they have an opportunity to, to get some favorable coverage, they thought, or to do something. So they hold a hearing about the threats to religious liberty. And, uh, you know, it was a great opportunity to raise awareness about this huge problem. And so there were two panels at that hearing, and the way it works in D.C. is, you, you know, Republicans get to choose some people, Democrats get to choose some people, or you have joint guests or whatnot. And Democrats had tried to put on the panel about religious liberty a law student named Sandra Fluck, and Republicans said, no, this, we need expert testimony, not like a law student who's a birth control activist. We want to talk about religious liberty. So they wouldn't let her on. And of course, you all probably know what happened at that point. Uh, you know, Democrats and Republicans both joined in some grandstanding, uh, you know, huge contentious um, hearing turned out to be you know, easily the most interesting hearing of the year, which is funny because I used to cover that committee all the time. It was like the most boring committee ever. And here I thought, oh, I was really excited that President Harrison was going to be addressing the committee. 
but I just never in my wildest dreams imagined it would be such a big news event. But of course, from the perspective of, the, of all of those people who care about religious liberty, it was great to be able to see people like President Harrison up there giving this eloquent, you know, vociferous defense of religious liberty and how important it is to us. You know, and I as a female was so, I mean, I can't tell you how exciting, oh, I forgot, I meant, did you guys see me crawl over when uh, President Harrison said, turn off your cell phone? And I was gonna come up and grab it, I didn't. I'm turning off my cell phone now, <laughs> I just wanna say. Okay, um, you know, all of my girlfriends were so excited. We, were, we felt so well represented, something that we hadn't, you know, because we're not political, it's rare that we can say, point to someone and say, yeah, that's, that's, that's my president of my church body and he's representing us very well. And it was very, you know, it was just wonderful. I was so, I was up in New York, you know, watching it and I was cheering on. And um, then when I watched the news coverage, it was all about how these evil men are war warring on women. And I thought, you know, as a woman, I find this so offensive that it's like I don't count. It's like nothing matters if you don't have the same views as Andrea Mitchell. And uh, so, of course, the media coverage of that hearing on religious liberty was an abomination. It was just horrible, including they said stuff like there were no women speaking on religious liberty or on the, as they called it, birth control. There were, in fact, two PhDs who spoke on the topic that day. So it was just completely in, inaccurate media coverage. I would like to point out also that Sandra Fluck was represented by that same PR firm that handled, that was closely tied to the Planned Parenthood PR push, both parts of the war on women. It is an interesting, you know, working with PR firms is something that happens all the time out in DC, but I wish people kind of knew how well orchestrated these things are how much planning goes into, you know, there are elections that need to be won, and if you want to win them, you have to pick out your target demographics, and you start planning well in advance to, to get those. And this was such manipulation and such a distortion of, you know, the truth, that I just wish people had a little bit better understanding of how much public relations firms play a role in what news gets put in the, in the outlets. Okay, so, um, you know, also at that time, White ha the White House put out a talking point about birth control that came from Planned Parenthood that was not true, but the media just ran with it. And they still do. I just noticed a resurgence of this talking point in the last two weeks. And the talking point is something like 98% of all women use birth control at all times. Have you heard this? Like this overwhelming figure of people are using birth control. It actually comes from a study done by the Planned Parenthood research arm, which was a study of people who are using birth control, basically. Um, <laughs> And in fact, you know, it, you, you, it was an age-limited group, you know, 15 to 40 or something like that. You didn't, they, they excluded people who were pregnant, people who were recently pregnant, people who were trying to get pregnant, people who were not sexually active. So, in other words, if you're sexually active and you're trying to not get pregnant, 98% of you have at one point in your past used birth control. So like, not, it, why is it not 100, is what I always wondered. Um, but. <laughs> Um, so they, they put forth this talking point, you know, and it just kind of shaded the truth again, and it became this thing, why do these people care about religious liberty if 150% of women are using, you know, birth control at all times? Um, and it just, you know, it just kept feeding and whatnot. And the media coverage was, again, <laughs> ridiculous. Even there's a media outlet that ostensibly covers religion news, and they, at one point, they covered a religious liberty conference, and they put it in scare quotes. Do you know what I mean by that? They put like quotes around it to suggest that maybe it's not really a big issue, this religious liberty concern. And I called them on it and this one reporter said, in, for all intents and purposes, he said, yeah, I did that because I don't believe that there are real religious liberty concerns and I think that you, know, you people just don't like President Obama. And his editor was like, well, I wouldn't go that far. Um, but we, we put scare quotes around things where they are contested issues. Like, are you kidding me? That is so ludicrous. And um, the idea that, like, take for instance, if the debate is contested. When was the last time you saw scare quotes around same-sex marriage? You don't. And that could not be more contested issue. You have on the one side people who think that marriage should be redefined to include same-sex couples. You have on the other side people who think that's an ontological impossibility. It's something that doesn't make any sense because marriage is, by definition, about sexual complementarity. So, if it, so it does, it's like a, it's just a word, it's a phrase that doesn't make sense. 
but we don't see the media putting scare quotes around it. In fact, they mock people who put scare quotes around it. Or what about abortion rights? You know, you have on the one side people who think you have the right to kill an unborn child. You have on the other side people who think you never have the right to kill um, you know, someone else. That's not a right. And yet we don't see scare quotes around that term. So it's just an interesting look at how um, the, the, you know, on certain social issues, you get favorable coverage, you get advocacy for things. On other social issues, you have, um, you know, hostility, refusal to understand the basic issues. And I actually have something I would uh, like to go in on that, but that's actually a longer section that I'm not sure. Actually, you know what, we'll do it. We'll, we'll just do this, we'll race through all this stuff, we'll take a break in a little bit, and then we can kind of do more of, um, of Q's and A's, because I don't know about you, but I cannot handle sitting for extended periods of time like this. So you guys are doing very, very well. Um, except for the two of you that are sleeping, but no big deal. I don't care <laughs> at all. Um, so there, the other big religious liberty issue, other than this contraception mandate that has been in the news in recent years, is related to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Actually, it gets into kind of details. The, the Hobby Lobby court decision was also related to the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. It was not a First Amendment case. So when the people were fighting for their religious liberty, they fought on the basis of a law that was passed nearly unanimously in 1993. It was signed by Bill Clinton. It was such a radical conservative law that it was passed unanimously and signed by Bill Clinton and introduced by Chuck Schumer, one of the most <laughs> liberal um, you know, members of the Senate. Or not at that time. And uh, what it was was a reaction to a bad Supreme Court decision that was authored by Antonin Scalia. And he had, um, there was a religious liberty case involving a minority in the Pacific Northwest, and he was a government employee who was also practicing a Native American religion that used peyote. And because he had failed a drug test after using the peyote in a religious service, he lost his job. And the Supreme Court said, sorry. So a lot of people were alarmed by this. Again, not because they necessarily care a lot about peyote or Native American religion, but because they care about religious liberty for all. And they were alarmed at a government that can say that, can also say that, you know, something about your religious views. So you had a broad coalition of people who worked to pass this Religious Freedom Restoration Act. So uncontroversial at the time that everybody signed on for the most part. And now uh, you have attempts, or so then what people also did is they passed state-based RIFRAs, is what we call them, Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And there was one in August, or, or sorry, it was um, February, where Arizona was considering a state-based RIFRA. And this was, they actually already had a state-based RIFRA, this was kind of an update to deal with uh, additional religious liberty concerns, you know, supported again by, uh, you know, liberals, conservatives, and whatnot. But someone got the idea that this might um, mean that people could have, oh, sorry, I just want to explain really quickly here too. RIFRAs don't say that you win a debate if you're religious, it just provides a framework for having that discussion in court. So it says the government must meet certain tests before they restrict your religious liberty. It's a very modest, just a good way of helping courts navigate the tension between religious liberty and other rights and giving them a framework for that discussion. So of course you know how this went then, in February, they decided that what this really was was an anti-gay bigotry bill. And again, people flipped out, you got all these news alerts, you know, headlining the news shows and whatnot. They were pretty sure that even though this is, you know, something that has been going on for decades, this legislation that people really enjoy, it's been very helpful that, you know, hundreds of people have used it for all sorts of different things where they're fighting the government or whatnot. They were pretty sure that they'd figured out that this was really just an attempt for those anti-gay bigots to um, come up with an excuse to be bigoted. And they killed the bill. I mean, the outcry was so extensive that they killed the bill. And I had written a piece about it um, called, what was it? I can't remember. But the original, I, I think it was like, hold on, can I look it up really quickly? <laughs> I told you, this, it's just, it's amazing I have any recall at all right now. Oh yeah. I called it dumb, uneducated, and eager to deceive. And this was a riff off of the, Was the old Washington Post headline. Washington Post had decades ago called evangelicals um, largely poor, uneducated, and easily led. That did not go over well with the evangelicals. It's really interesting. Uh, they did not enjoy that at all. Anyway, 
Uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, finish this in, uh, in a few minutes, but I think we have to break now. OK. Um, wait. Is that? Yep, it's on. It's on. OK. I was told I was speaking way too fast, that I need to slow way down. And I would just like, if I, if I speed up again, someone needs to shout at me, <laughs> if that's possible. OK, I'd spoken with a few people during the break, so I will catch up with a few of the things that, uh, that they mentioned. One is that uh, I told the story about Kermit Gosnell and the lack of media coverage. And one of the interesting after effects of that was that it was such an amazing story, horrific but amazing story, and it was not told. It was not told in any way appropriately or accurately or sufficiently by the media. And so there is a filmmaker named Phelan McAleer, and he decided he wanted to make a movie about it. And normally, he makes documentary films. He's an Irish man, and he has done some uh, big documentaries. He decided, and I met with him before this, um, before this went live, and I thought it was crazy. He said he was going to raise millions of dollars and make a movie. I thought, that is not going to happen. So he did one of those crowdfunding sites where you say, I'm going to make a movie. Would you give me $10 or whatever? He raised, do you know Caroline? I think it was like $2.1 million from contributions from people who just want the story told. They know it's a, they know it's a story that should have been told by the media, and it wasn't. So um, he might make a feature film out of this. Well, he will make a feature film out of this. He raised the, uh, the funding for it. OK, another thing that was, they're also testing my mic right now, so I'm not sure if, I, if it's good to go or not. I might need to get a thumbs up. But um, oh, yeah, OK, two, two things. One was that um, Mrs. Harrison asked a question about the significant problems that the country faces and, and how to uh, work in that environment without getting discouraged. And this was something I actually meant to mention when I was talking about things that being Lutheran has helped me with. And I think that speaking the truth in this current environment we're in is, it's a hostile environment, it certainly is. But Lutherans are known for just having our bold confession of faith and that has really served me well. I've always understood that we have this wonderful gift um, that keeps me optimistic, too. I'm not surprised that the world is sinful, that we're all sinful, that we all mess up, that there are bad things happening. I, I expect it. Uh, but I also know this wonderful forgiveness that we have, this new life in Christ, and it makes, I mean, how can you be pessimistic when you have that? I don't even understand how it's possible. Yes, things are bad, and I, it, the country is uh, facing serious problems, and it's probably going to get a lot worse. But Jesus Christ has vanquished death, and that is really wonderful news, and it, it helps you just be optimistic and positive in a hostile media environment. And then another thing that someone talked about was we all know that the media coverage of religion news and social issues is horrible, right? What do you do about it? And this is a very tricky question. You don't want to just seek out media sources that agree with you. That's, you don't want to be closed off from what the rest of the world is experiencing. Um, but it's so discouraging to see just how one-sided the media are. So what can you do? And I would say that it takes time, but every time that you read a story in the newspaper and you see that they got something wrong about your church or about some larger issue, just drop an email. I mean, it's easier now than ever to just drop an email to the reporter. Be nice for two reasons. One, it's what you should always be. And two, there is nobody on earth more defensive than a journalist. I don't know why, but they just get so defensive about any little criticism. So if you, if you talk to them in anger, they will just turn, turn off. They won't listen to what you have to say. 
but just presenting nicely to your reporter neighbor a discussion of what they got wrong or why it discouraged you, it really does make a difference. And I think it's important also that you be proactive when you are dealing with a media type environment. If you are, you know, take for, in, for instance, differently than other people. This is both a problem in the media environment, but it's also an opportunity. If there is a community tragedy, no, we don't, uh, we don't call up the Sikhs and say, come on over and preach. But we do probably say, we're having a worship service immediately. I mean, I live in Washington, D.C., and when September 11th happened, we had an emergency worship service that night. Everybody who could make it made it, even if, you know, it, they were coming across bridges or whatnot that were shut down, but we all gathered and we had a worship service. Obviously, getting media coverage for something like that is not on the top of your list uh, during a national tragedy, but you can tell reporters we are doing this worship service at this point in time. And what's nice about that also is you get, oh, am I going to be doing, how many microphones will I have here? We now have tested our battery length on a wireless mic. Oh, and this is on? Okay, great. And... So if, you, if you're doing a worship service, one thing that's really interesting is that the media partly cover the Episcopal Church so much because the Episcopal Church is really pretty to cover. Their clergy always have vestments on and they have you know, beautiful church buildings and whatnot. Well, we do too. So uh, if, they, if the media wants to say something religious is happening, they're probably gonna, and this is not necessarily great on their part, but they're not gonna go to an image of a guy speaking on a platform who could be leading a TED talk, like it appears at some evangelical churches. But they would love that shorthand of, that's a vested clergyman, he's leading a worship service. You can see that when we have our worship. So we can be more media friendly and just let the media know and be open to them, answer questions, and um, just um, be proactive. But also, when you see something bad, go ahead and talk to people about it. Okay, how's the microphone situation? Am I speaking slowly enough? Okay, I'm really sorry about that. I, I can modulate my rate of speech, but it's hard. And then once I go slow, you know, it's just, it's, a, it's, a, it's still that morning issue. But um, So I was talking about the Religious Freedom Restoration Act and the media coverage of same. Now what's very disconcerting right now is that this federal legislation that was passed so overwhelmingly, is that 20 years ago? Yeah, is now under serious threat. And partly it's just partisan politicking. We talked about the war on women, and um, it's, you know, Democrats are, are about to have a bad election and they're doing what they can to get base voters out. This is just normal, Republicans do it too, and the best way that they know how is to scaremonger about contraception. And because this Supreme Court battle was based around RIFRA, they're trying to modify or remove RIFRA. This is the primary means of religious liberty that we have uh, that, we, that we fight religious liberty battles. And I don't know how much of it is just about an attempt to win elections and how much of it is serious, but it is a very serious threat. And people need to be aware and they need to um, understand that um, the culture is less receptive to religious liberty than it was, say, at our founding when uh, our country's founding when it was the first thing mentioned in the First Amendment. In my piece where I talked about how idiotic the media were when discussing RIFRA, I pointed out that, well, I have an editor friend who said that he thought the media were pretty good about freedom of the press and freedom of speech because uh, they, they use those freedoms, and that the media are not good about freedom of religion because they don't. 
that is a legitimate concern. Many people in the media are not religious or they are not, uh, their, their rates of worship are far less than the average population. And I can't remember the, there, there have been studies done on this. So if 40% of the average American population goes to church weekly, I think it's something like 8% for journalists. So they're just much less religious. And they, um, you know, when I worked in one newsroom and I showed up on Ash Wednesday with ashes on my forehead, uh, I was told by several colleagues that I had something on my forehead. (laughs) And if you think about how sheltered you have to be to not know any Catholics or Lutherans, or to have never experienced an Ash Wednesday, or to not have even read about it. I mean, we're dealing with serious ignorance, limitations um, in people's education, and then also limitations in how much they know the outside world. This is you know, a really big problem. But what's also interesting is that religious liberty is that our freedom of the press and our freedom of speech, which the media do tend to care about, are deeply rooted in freedom of religion. And I'm sure many of us as school children learned about the John Peter Zanger trial, uh, which is, people know it a lot because of the argument that truth can be introduced as a defense. But it was really about religious expression. And in that, you know, colonial time when people were coming from all different walks of life and all sorts of different religious views, people really believed that you had to be free to understand truth. And what that really meant was free to be religious. And from that, you had to be free to argue for it and free to put it in newspapers. And now we have a culture that is so hostile to religious liberty that our media don't, you know, they scare quote the term instead of understanding where it comes from. And that case in Arizona, which was a pretty mild RIFRA expansion that got killed because of media outrage was a good example of the battles that we will face. So I do think, you know, it's challenging because it's hard to keep up with a culture that goes from thinking something is fairly non-controversial, religious liberty, to something that is the biggest threat in a span of 20 years, but that's where we are. And Uh, If you care about religious liberty for yourself and for your fellow man, regardless of what their religion is, as you should, then we need to start being more proactive and resisting media bias and ignorance and hostility to the concept. Unlike what President Harrison said, I think, and I really do believe this, it would be better if we could ask questions that I can respond to because I don't really know, I don't know you people, Okay, I know some of you people, and on that note, I love David Berger. Who knows David Berger here? Isn't he the best? He is just awesome. Um, And uh, my buddy Charlie Henriksen back here. Uh, But I would really appreciate it if you could ask questions and then I can answer them because it could get dangerous where I go from here, and I would much rather uh, hear what you would like to talk about. I'm not that moderate, so I won't moderate that much. So, uh, <laughs> great. Okay. Uh, I see the distinguished-looking uh, clergyman in the back, Mr. Reverend Charles Hendrickson. Hello. Good to see you. Great seeing you. I was looking for you in the cardinal scheme last night. Were you wearing red? Yes. Yes, I was the person wearing red. <laughs> directly related to homosexual, scare quote, marriage ceremonies. Uh, There was a bill in the Kansas House, I believe within the last year, trying to protect those religious liberties. I don't know the outcome of that bill. I don't think it made it through the whole process. Uh, In Arizona, I think this is the case you're talking about, it was passed by their legislature and then vetoed by, I think, a Missouri Senate Lutheran Governor, Jan Brewer, which was disappointing, Mm -hmm. on the grounds that, well, what they think is it would lose the Super Bowl for them. Um, 
if they, if, that the NFL would not come and do the Super Bowl at Phoenix. There was a baker in one of our western states just recently named Phillips, I believe his name, and he was ordered by the state to provide a wedding cake for a homosexual couple and to undergo uh, re-education, I think, for his bakery and staff. Um, any comments on the coverage in the media of these types of issues? A few. <laughs> so I, I hope everybody heard the question, but we're talking about the conflict between religious liberty and gay rights. And this is, in, in many ways, it's just, it's a legitimate conflict. There is a conflict here, and it is something that needs to be debated and discussed so that we can figure out how, as a society that has broadly accepted um, individual sexual expression as the most important value that we hold, I mean, I don't think that's true in this room, perhaps, but in the larger culture, that's certainly what we're facing. How do we balance that with our deeply rooted uh, belief in religious liberty? This is something that is difficult to navigate. Um, Chai Feldblum, who is on the EEOC, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and is a gay rights activist and a Georgetown law professor, I believe, has spoken on this issue. She says that um, in the battle between religious liberty and gay rights, she cannot think of an example where religious liberty should win. And she wasn't even saying it in an activist way, so much as talking about the way that our laws are set up right now or the way case law has been going. And I think you can see that's exactly what's been happening, whether it's through executive order, through the courts, or through legislation. We're seeing religious liberty being uh, fought against as a barrier to gay rights, which are the most important thing our culture has right now. And it is a fascinating issue to explore. The media have done a horrific job so in the media narrative, you have perfect people who have never done anything wrong and who simply want to love each other versus little demons who just are out to destroy people's lives for fun. That's kind of the narrative that gets presented. It's unfair. It's, it's juvenile. It's immature. It's a legitimate conflict. You know, I mean, we might have views as Lutherans, or as uh, conservatives about what should dominate, but we can understand at least that there's a different side to the story or that we would like to have a conversation about it. And my favorite example of this was this florist in, I think, Seattle. And she had served two customers for a long time. They loved her, like she did all their flowers. There was no question that when they joined together in a same-sex union, they wanted her to do the flowers. She had served them lovingly for years, as she would serve any customer. She declined to do the flowers for a religious service that violated her conscience. And I think she's currently facing two lawsuits, I think one from the state and one from the ACLU um, that filed on behalf of the customers. I mean, she's facing an unbelievable legal battle just to retain her conscience rights. Baronelle Stutzman, that's her name. And, you know, I've written about her and other people who face tremendous legal battles even in states that have not redefined marriage to include same-sex couples or other groupings. There's a photographer in New Mexico who declined to photograph a lesbian commitment ceremony. And I think New Mexico defines marriage as something between a man and a woman. So she was, you know, it wasn't even a state that had... had made that change to marriage law. And she was brought before a human rights tribunal, and she lost, and she appealed, and she lost. And she faced a you know, massive fine, and she is being forced by the state to violate her conscience. And you know, the, the ruling from whichever court that was the ultimate court where it ended was terrifying to read about how basically, I think it was, the gist of it was that you have the right to your religious beliefs, just don't act on them. And <laughs> that's one of my favorite things on the RIFRA legislation. The Los Angeles Times wrote about the Arizona case, and after lambasting everybody as bigots and awful and whatnot, 
They said, they had a little line in there that said, you know, technically, this is just a clarification of a minor religious liberty issue. And then they went on. It's like, oh, tech, oh no, they said tech, of, a, of uh, the right to religious, what, they said something like, um, the right to your religious beliefs in practice. I thought, oh yes, in practice as opposed to in your head? I mean, the idea that you only can be religious in your head is a very weird new understanding that certain people are pushing about religious liberty. So it is an, you know, that is the issue on which the media coverage has perhaps been the worst. They are incapable of understanding different arguments on the topic of marriage and marriage law. And it is a terrifying thing to go up against because if you do not speak the party line, you are ostracized, you are vilified. In the media, it's almost impossible. But I did it. <laughs> um, I've kind of gotten sick of it. It's like not even a topic that I care that much about, but after Brandon Ike was pushed out as CEO of the company he founded, Mozilla, because everyone agreed he was a great guy, great boss, you know, uh, founder of open source technology. He, uh, he'd done everything right as a boss, except that he had given $1,000 to the Prop 8 fight in California. That information was released by the state of California. People targeted all donors who had tried to retain the understanding of marriage, and they went after them. You could be a waitress who'd given 100 bucks or whatnot, and you were on a list of people to be targeted. People have been run out of jobs in theater companies. Um, restaurants have been boycotted. Churches, houses of worship have been targeted for violence in California if they worked for Prop 8 to pass, which it did before it was overturned. Um, and this social media mob demanded Brandon Ike be ousted, not for anything that he'd done to uh, treat people poorly or uh, discriminate against people who are attracted to people of the same sex, but just because he believed that marriage is a union of one man and one woman. And this is an issue where if you have not figured out that the culture is hostile and taking prisoners, you know, you better wake up to it. It's going to be serious. And a lot of people are only worried about the issue of will churches be required to, uh, to perform same-sex unions? That is actually probably the only issue out of a thousand related to same-sex marriage that you don't need to worry about. I mean, the people who are protected are people who are pastors, and the people who aren't protected are all the rest of us. So if you're doing something, you know, not that, not that it still won't be an attack on churches and pastors, believe me, it will be, but let's say that you have worked as a county clerk for your entire career, and your state law changes, and you had no idea when you started that job that you would ever be asked to do something that significantly violated your conscience, as it does for a lot of people to um, issue same-sex marriage licenses. You, know, you will lose your job. Even if, you know, think about that. Maybe you started working at a time when literally no one on earth had even thought of same-sex marriage. But now you're a bigot who must be fired. I mean, these are, let's say you're a public school teacher. Let's say, um, you know, I mean, there are all the issues that you can think about. Business owners, people working in any level of government, uh, that's whose religious liberty is going to be violated. And people like us are people who don't have big lobbying firms at our back. We don't have money to hire big, you know, defense teams or whatnot. And, you know, the Catholic Church, they have a lot of money to lobby for whatever religious exemption they need when you have these changes in law. But the rest of us do not. Uh, you know, Lutheran Church, Missouri Synod will certainly fight battles for religious liberty for the church and for the pastors and for the members of synod, um, meaning people who are on the, on the roster. But the rest of us have to navigate these things mostly on our own. So I think we need to be aware and uh, ready for a fight. Sorry to be so grim about that. You, sir. Uh, 
I have a question really quickly. You're not Canadian, are you? No. Okay. I don't, I don't like Canadians, so I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> just kidding. So, through this uh, radical pro-gay rights lobby, is this successfully uh, penetrating North America to other nations, such as Russia, the Sochi 2014, or is that just a media illusion and most of Russia, or most of the world, that maintains their more traditional uh, view of things? I was just talking to my dad about this curious situation of how the United States handled the Olympics. This isn't really dealing with media coverage, which I will get to in just a second. Um, so, you know, Vladimir Putin, a very strong leader of his country, has wanted people in his country to believe that the only thing that Americans care about is gay sex. So he presents this model that he is, um, in addition to all his normal dictator-like activities, he's defending cultural traditions that the U.S. is opposed to. Now, what makes this a, a foreign policy threat is that there's an element of truth to this. The U.S. is, in fact, putting a lot of effort in its diplomacy not to fight for, say, religious liberty, but to fight for gay rights. And so Putin, you know, to, which this helps him domestically, paints this image that all we are is a bunch of, you know, again, gay sex loving people who don't care about Christianity. And so we thought a good way to respond to this would be to send like an all gay delegation of representatives to the Russian, to the, to the Olympics there. Because apparently we thought that proving him right would be the great way to like handle, you know, I mean, on the one hand, it's kind of funny, I guess, that you would respond to people who uh, criticize you for, for some of your values. You would respond with a big, um, oh yeah, well, you know, yes, we do, we do care a lot about this issue. But on another, it was kind of a juvenile foreign policy stunt, and it's not like, say, there's any threat here with what Russia can do in terms of blowing passenger airlines out of the sky this week. Um, and so what I think is interesting about it is the media are only able, again, to view this story from one side. They are only able to view it as everyone. They, they have a doctrinal view is the best way to understand it. So whereas Lutherans might have an understanding that sex is a gift from God, that it is to be enjoyed in the context of marriage, that marriage is an institution based on sexual complementarity, that we are each made male or female, that this too is a gift from God, and that we get to enjoy that expression in union, in a one flesh union, which by definition is only possible between one man and one woman. And what I mean by that, when I say one flesh union is only possible that way, you think about all of your biological systems and you retain 100% of your biological systems except for one where you have half, basically. And that would be sexual reproduction. And so in order to have a baby, naturally, the only way is to join a man and a woman together. This is the understanding on which marriage is based. This is not bigotry, it's science, it's reality, it's nature. And the media are incapable of understanding this because they have a doctrinal view that limits their ability to understand other perspectives. So when they cover things like Sochi and what's happening in Russia with their limitations on gay rights versus our expansive understanding of gay rights, they, uh, I think it limits their ability to cover the issue in a way that, that relates to what the rest of the world is understanding in terms of the importance of sexual morality as being built upon sexual complementarity. And this is not just a problem in Russia, but it's a huge problem in Africa. And there are cultures there where I almost feel like American reporters, again, are incapable of understanding what the situation is in Africa when they're covering limitations on gay rights there versus what happens. Um, there's even an interesting thing where the Archbishop of Canterbury had been, I can't remember which country he was in, but there had been attacks on Christians, I think Anglicans, because other Anglican church bodies had been liberalizing gay rights issues. And the Archbishop said something like, he just wished that 
the larger Anglican communion understood that in Africa you die for affiliation with liberal Episcopalians or something. Um, because it's a sad reality of the situation about how people resolve things. And the media just, they thought he was blaming gay people for the deaths of Africans and whatnot. They just, they're, they're so one-sided on this issue that they, they can't cover the issue fairly. Sorry, just repeating that, but anyway, I'm not sure if that answers it, but. Okay, next. I'm just gonna call on people if they don't raise their hands, yes. I noticed that in a number of your articles that you quote Martin Luther, uh, and I was just wondering what kind of reaction do you get from such quotations and does that persuade people? Well, one thing that I think is really interesting, I don't know if you, as you should, go back and read your large catechism or whatnot, I always read it and I think, it is amazing that this was written 500 years ago. It is amazing. It reads like it was yesterday's, you know, paper or whatnot. And even, I mean, I remember one time, I think I was writing an article about the mommy wars, you know, should you work, should you not work, should you nurse, not nurse, all these types of things. But I'd quoted Martin Luther saying something about how when, when fathers change their children's diapers or rock their babies to sleep, they should view it as a holy blessing, that they get this opportunity to serve their children this way. And I'm thinking, you know, this must be why I have such like a, why I didn't turn into a feminist, because I was raised by a Lutheran father who did, in fact, you know, rock me and did not view that as something that, you know, women do or whatnot. We have such a balanced view of uh, division of labor and... Uh, what it means to serve as opposed to, um, you know, fighting for what's yours. But, I mean, you think about that. You have a major religious leader talking about the importance of fathers serving their, their wives and children. That, it's invigorating and it's fresh and it doesn't seem like it's 500 years old. So, anyway, depending on what you're quoting from Martin Luther, the reception is generally pretty favorable. But it's, uh, there's a lot there that can be just used and without, you know, without any modification. Although I was joking that I have this idea that I'm going to rewrite the large catechism but put it in a really um, user-friendly title, like the top ten commandments of management. <laughs> but I just kind of keep it exactly as is and then put it out, and then people would be, they would, they would get duped into reading a great book, large catechism. Because um, you can read it all that way. I mean, it's just, it's all about your vocation under different commandments. Uh, and it's nice. Okay. Well, in the last couple of posts that you've made, you've been talking about the ignorance of the media or feigned ignorance of, by, by media. And I was thinking of that, oh dear, I shouldn't have started this because I can't remember, <laughs> about um, that there was a, a meeting, um, I think maybe the Heritage Foundation, and there was a woman in the, in the group, um, American Muslim woman. And the whole panel was very cordial in this discussion about, I'm not even sure. Oh, I am because I wrote the story. So I will. Um. <laughs> I would. So it's actually funny. I, I try not to take things personally. And in fact, I, you know, I, I generally don't. But um, I was on a panel at the Heritage Foundation where we were talking about uh, the importance of marriage. And I was with two other women. And we were talking about just how important it is, particularly if you're in lower economic social situations. If you're not married, you're much more likely to be poor, and the outcomes for your children are going to be very bad. And this reporter, who you are talking about, covered that event. He sat right in front of me, and he said that I had told, well, gosh, told um, 
women to take it easy and lean back and just pop out some kids and let men do the work. And I was like, I was there, and I remember this. And I'd also sort of, I'd made a joke, you know, and I have this sarcasm, which is bad if it's recorded and snipped, but I'd made a joke about <laughs> how, you know, it was, a, it was a kind of a younger crowd, and I said, everybody should just leave right now, just go marry the next person you see on the street, and everything will be better. And I was just making a joke. So, of course, MSNBC decided that, that would be, I'd be their bad person for the week because I was making a joke about the importance of marriage. But he totally misconstrued everything. I mean, we'd had a lovely discussion. There was a liberal man there who said, you know, I don't think I agree with you on a lot of stuff, but I'm an educator. And my wife and I have seen the, the terrible outcomes that happen um, from children who have no relationship with their father or whatnot. You know, it was that kind of civil discussion, but he presented it as if we were, you know, he just wanted it to be part of this war on women meme. So I remembered that. So next time he covers a heritage panel and says, the way he, the way he presented it was alarming. He said that a bunch of horrible people had attacked an innocent woman and that it was the, like the worst thing he'd ever seen. And on Twitter, reporters took his quotes, you know, and he always quotes people accurately. He just doesn't tell the truth before or after that. And they said, well, look at this. This looks horrible. And, um, and I knew because he had done it to me that it probably wasn't true. So, yes, I decided to watch, you know, I got the tape and watched it. Turned out he had completely invented the entire scenario. What you had was, first of all, it was a discussion about I think like Benghazi and the situation there, it was not about Muslims and it was not about Muslim Americans. But there was a woman who was an activist and uh, she, you know, kind of a well-known activist in the Pacific Northwest and she asked a question about uh, Muslim Americans and the panel all responded very graciously, you know, talking about how she said she didn't think that all Muslims were terrorists or something. And the panel said, of course not, of course not. We're talking about, uh, you know, there is a problem with Islamic terrorism, as anyone who knows anything about the world knows, but, you know, it's a, it's a percentage of that population that is violent or resorting to extremist ends, but that is a serious problem. And they had like a really fun and interesting conversation, but he had completely misrepresented the entire situation. And what was great, though, was because I had known that he made stuff up and was able to respond quickly. The story ended up being about how he had made stuff up instead of about how, uh, you know, how horrible these right-wingers were for, for what they'd said. But it does, it speaks again to the importance of being on top of these things right away, being able to combat a messaging machine that is much larger than any of us and how you know we need people sort of in all quarters who are able to predict and combat um, very hostile media environment but anyway yes sir even for us back in Australia and some of the issues that we're dealing with probably haven't surfaced as much as some of the issues you've mentioned here today in Australia, but certainly on the cusp uh, and in different ways. Uh, my question is, um, and you've gone through some really wonderful stuff, I was wondering if there's some practical little things or snippets that uh, you could share that, you know, even from Australia, that we could help support you uh, in this uh, cause that you're, that you're working with. And is there anything that we can do and be prepared for, I suppose, a little bit in Australia, but also, I suppose, as individuals in this challenge to keep raising awareness that Christians, I mean, we do love people, and God is a God of love, and, uh, and share that way. Um, and I just wondered if you have any insights. Into that. Sure. Well, thank you. That's very nice. Um, as far as what can be done, I think that the most important thing is actually what we each do in our day-to-day -day interactions. I think that we have, you know, things have happened in this culture that we have not 
we didn't want to happen and we weren't prepared for what was happening and we need to realize how different we are from the rest of the culture. And we need to understand that there are people who have extremely negative views about Christianity. They have incorrect views about Christianity. Part of this is about the media who have done a horrific job and who are hostile to Christianity in large, in, in, in significant places. They are hostile. Not all. There are many good reporters, but, you know, it's a problem. But it's also true that Christians themselves have done a very poor job of conveying basic teachings, or errors in doctrine have led to the natural result that people have a negative view. Either uh, refusal to stand firm on ancient Christian teachings about sexual morality, which happens in certain quarters, or an overemphasis on other people's sin relative to our own. I mean, we know, if we're Lutheran, we hear about this every single Sunday. We know we confess our sins. We know we are sinners. This is the importance of, um, we, we hear the beautiful message of the gospel every week, which we need to hear. Well, we need to think about how in our day-to-day -day interactions, how we present to other people and what we're sharing. Do we want to tell the world about this wonderful gift that we have, this liberating gift, this freedom that we have in Christ? Or do we want to be angry and judgmental and whatnot? The way that we present these issues is very important on a personal level, I think. And um, even how we talk about, you know, we, we grieve over what happens in abortion, but we love everyone, including the people who are considering, you know, right then, an abortion. Um, speaking in love about people's situation, you know, we all mess up our lives. We all do things that are, we, we mess up all the time. We sin, and we should be humble about it in how we interact with other people in our day-to-day -day affairs, which I think also makes people more receptive to the larger issues, these in sort of difficult, larger social issues. So I, you know, I'm pleased to be part of a congregation out in Virginia that has a lot of people who are working on a lot of these issues. I mean, I'm not sure if you know that the Hammond girls who are from this congregation work on religious liberty out in D.C., and they do amazing work. It's just, you know, there are individuals in the, the there's um, a niece of someone who's here today who's a very important lawyer out in uh, D.C. who's working on, um, who works on federal election issues, and she is fantastic. We have people working in the media. There are many people who are reporters who are you know, at my congregation, or um, attorneys, or Hill staff, or lobbyists, or whatnot. And we all can do work in our own vocation, vocations like that. But I think most importantly is how we interact with our children, our siblings, our friends, and whatnot. So I would hope we would understand that that's how the culture gets lost, by not having those conversations with the people closest to us. Um, That's you. Kind of segue, I guess that was actually your point, but kind of segue on that, but make it more personal now. Have you, have, been, have you experienced or been you know, watched journalists who have been on the liberal side and not really so who all of a sudden wake up one day and realize that they're Christian? I don't know. I mean, I have friends in media who have converted. I don't actually have friends in media who have converted and as a result have changed their politics. Um, and that's true of people on the left and the right for the most part, except that I have noticed that it almost always goes that if you become Christian, you become much more charitable to the people that you're covering and to the people you disagree with. But other than that, I haven't really seen, I don't know, I'm sure there are examples that, I, that I'll come up with in about six hours in which I will <laughs> tweet it out. Um, but I do think there has been a little bit of a breakdown in civility among reporters, and people are just extremely partisan. I have written about media ignorance a lot recently because people are putting partisan goals, I mean, I'm not saying like Democrat or Republican so much as just whatever their agenda item is, 
they're putting that above telling a story factually. And it's hard to have civil discourse with people who are willing to do anything to advance a storyline or protect a certain politician rather than do their jobs. I joke that we need a Republican president just so that reporters can remember how to do investigations. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, they're really good. Like, when a Republican is president, they are very good. They'll dig anywhere. They'll dig through your trash. They will do whatever it takes. Very difficult. They lose the skills during, um, or they have lost the skills in, in this administration. That is a challenging environment. I mean, I do, it's, it's annoying to keep pointing this out, but can you imagine if George W. Bush had done, like, half the stuff that has been done by this administration in the last two months? I mean, it would just be a complete media implosion, but you can't even get an update on, like, say, uh, an abuse of power scandal at the IRS. This, is, this used to be what we lived for as reporters, the ability to dig into this type of scandal. I mean, that's what Watergate was. And all these people think that they became reporters because of stuff like that, but then they lose the interest if their politics are aligned with the person who's in office. But anyway, going off on that. Yes, sir. First off, I just want to thank you and the organizers for this. I've been following you on Twitter for a couple of years, so it's great to hear you speak. What is your handle, if I may ask? <laughs> Okay. <laughs> now, I was in the military in 2012 when the Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed, and uh, I've since been separated from the military, but can you speak a little bit, or do you have any insight into religious freedom in the military as, over the past couple of years, um, especially with regards to homosexuality or Bible verses being put in public places? things of that nature. Right. That is a, that's one of the most interesting areas to cover for religious liberty is the military. Uh, it, it's kind of unique. Um, it is unique in many ways because of its relationship, the military's relationship to the government, but it kind of previews a bunch of battles that will be coming down the pike. And what's interesting about that is the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod has had many people involved in the chaplain corps, which kind of sets policy related to how to navigate these issues. And that has been a blessing that we have people who can think through these issues and help people who are in our church body navigate them. But the important thing to remember about the military is that it's just a microcosm of the rest of society. So whatever else is happening in society is of course going to happen in the military. We've already quickly gone from issues of don't ask, don't tell into the next issue, which will be transgender, um, how to treat troops who believe they are of a different sex than what they were born. And that is going to be you know, a huge issue. What we're most concerned about when we're talking about religious liberty, though, is the ability of chaplains to retain their confession of faith as they do their work ministering to troops. And we actually have pretty good precedent on all this stuff. We have, and, and it's, in many ways, the entire country should thank the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod for some of this, because we have such interesting different views on, um, say, I mean, we, we've had to navigate issues dealing with, say, uh, ordaining females to the priesthood of other church bodies. How do we work with them in, in the military sense when we are working uh, with people who we don't agree with and whatnot. We have had to navigate these issues in how we do worship and how we are not forced to violate our conscience on other issues like interfaith worship, you know, female priests or something like that. And because we have established these excellent guidelines, we're better able to handle the new threats that come down the line. Um, so what is deeply disconcerting, I think, is what's going to happen to people. You know, the military goes from being hostile to something to basically mandating it like that. So now to, to, to get through the military, you'll be judged partially on like how gay friendly you are, basically. That's gonna be a challenge for individuals, but it's not, uh, you know, it's still a voluntary organization and it is something that people can now kind of go in with open eyes about how much they want to be part of an institution that has that as, um, as a primary goal above, say, defending the nation. <laughs> but, um, 
There actually, I, I do know a journalist who's writing a book on all the different social issues that are hitting the military, and I am looking forward to, uh, to what he has to write about it, because uh, it is a, it's an opportunity, it's, a, you know, it's an area that you could write a lot about. But. Oh, yes, sorry, one quick. Miss Henriksen. We have time for one more question. Yeah. Orange is the new black yeah. TV She's show. A transgender actress on that show, and she was recently the first transgender person to be on the cover of Time. So I was wondering if you noticed a big sort of new front in journalism advocating for Well, you just hit on it yourself because one of the main issues there is do you refer to someone who is male who either identifies as female or has had surgery to, uh, to take on female body parts, do you refer to that person as male or female? Um, this is actually a very tricky issue, much trickier than the media would let on. They just decided to go with whatever you say. So like, if you say that you're, if I say I'm a male, I identify as a male, they are required, they're, new journalism standards say that you should, re, you should refer to me as a male. Um, that is one of the ways the media has handled it, and it just shows you, though, more than anything, how the progressive march is unyielding. So, you know, that's the issue of the moment. In two years, it's going to be another issue once we have rewritten all laws to accommodate, you know, transgender issues or whatnot. Um, there will be something else that, you know, I assume, I kind of suspect it'll be people who identify as animals or, um, or you know, people, there's like a very small contingent of people who identify as other kin or um, things that are not human or whatnot. I do think that will be an avenue that we go to soon, and you will be the worst human in the world if you resist it, just don't forget. Um, but it is a challenging, it's a challenging media environment, and they are, of course, on the side that you would expect them to be, which is activism for this. And I just want to say really quickly, in a way, it's clarifying. In a, in a way, dealing with transgender issues helped me realize what all of this has to do with everything else, which is you either view sex as a gift from God, you either view it as something God has given you to be enjoyed and received, or you view basically it as something that can be changed, a triumph of technology over these blessings from God. And our media are definitely in that other camp. It affects how they talk about marriage, it affects how they talk about gender, sex in general, abortion, contraception, child rearing. They view all these things as, all these gifts that we have from God as things to be overcome, fought against, or resisted. And uh, you have to join the fight as well. With that, we bring to a close our inaugural lecture of the series. Uh, join me in thanking Molly for uh, kicking this off in a magnificent way. <laughs> so, my notes from my senior pastor say, adjourn with prayer slash blessing. So shall we do that? We all rise. <laughs>